All right, today is Gothic. So here we go on Gothic. I'm going to tell you a few things that you know already right off of the bat. Uh, the Elk Mountains extend in the northern area of the Gunnison country. There are six mountains 14,000 feet or better between here and Aspen. North and South Maroon Bells, Capitol Peak, Castle Peak, Pyramid Peak, and Snowmass Peak. And that's one of the six great mountain ranges in Colorado, 14,000 feet or better. One of them is called the Sangre de Cristos, which run from northern New Mexico into southern Colorado. Kit Carson, Mount Blanca, etc. Eight mountains, 14,000 feet or better, all on the eastern slope. Another mountain range is the San Juan Range, nine of them, 14,000 feet or better, Silverton, Lake City, that area. Three of them are located in Telluride, Wilson Peak, Mount Wilson, and El Diente, San Miguel Range. Another one are 20 mountains that one first sees as you come from the plains into Denver, and that area is most appropriately called the Front Range. Highlighted by three mountains that are historically very important in the history of the United States, Long's Peak, Mount Evans, and Pike's Peak, three of the 20. The fifth mountain range is one that you see and drive along as you go from Pontius Springs up towards Leadville and beyond. And high on the left side of the road, you see a range that most people refer to as the Collegiate Range, but that's not the name of it. The name of that range is called the Sawatch Range. 15 mountains, 14,000 feet or better, one of the great mountain ranges on the North American continent. Going from Mount Chavano and Tabo Watch near Monarch Pass all the way to the Mount of the Holy Cross. Only one of the mountains, unfortunately, I hang my head when I say this, only one of the mountains is located on the western slope. All the others are on the eastern slope. The only one on the western slope is Mount of the Holy Cross. They also do not make up the Continental Divide because they're all on the eastern slope. The ones that make up the Continental Divide are the ones, if you go to Taylor Park, that first range you look at, Grizzly and an Ice Mountain, that is the divide. And then the last great mountain range in Colorado, of the 54 mountains that are 14,000 feet or better, is the Elk Range between here and Aspen. The Elks make up 800 square miles. There are a number of mountains that are 13,000 feet or better, and they include the following, Tiacali, 13,208, Italian Peak, 13,225, Bellevue, 13,233, Treasure, 13,528, Treasury, 13,462, and Hagerman, 13,841. So there's a lot of high mountains outside of the 14,000 footers. The Elk Range has had great mineral wealth, very, very difficult weather, which allows the area to be open for about six months out of the year, and extremely difficult transportation. More about all three of those in a moment. The major passes I'll run through very quickly. Taylor Pass, 11,800 feet. I mean, anybody going over Taylor Pass, I mean, all that is is a damn stream bed. And it's not dangerous, it's just so bumpy that I don't even know it's hardly passable anymore. Star Pass, Pearl Pass, 10,705, Conundrum, 12,4, Triangle, 12,5, East Maroon, 11,8, West Maroon, 12,4, Trail Rider, 12,4, Schofield, 10,7, and Hasley, 12,4. The Basins, Copper Basin, Virginia Basin, Queen Basin, Brush Creek, Rustler Gulch, and the East River Valley, those are the great areas in and around Gothic. Gothic very early was a transportation hub. And one of the roads out of Gothic went straight north over Schofield Pass down into Crystal Marble and Carbondale. 
Another one headed east over East Maroon Pass or West Maroon Pass down towards Maroon Lake and into the number one silver mining town in the world, the great town of Aspen. And another road ran south along the East River down towards Crested Butte and heading down towards Gunnison. The East River and Copper Creek had been placer mined in the 1860s and early 1870s. More about that in a little while. Ferdinand Hayden, as I told you on the first day, had come into this area in 1874 and standing on top of Mount Tiakali looked off in the distance and called those two mountains the Crested Buttes. And obviously later on they said that Gothic Mountain resembled a Gothic cathedral and changed the name to Gothic and dropped the S and the other one became known as Crested Butte. So Gothic is located in the shadows of Gothic Peak. The exact elevation of Gothic is 9,464 feet in elevation, located right where the East River and Copper Creek come together. The camp began in 1879 following silver discoveries by two brothers named John and David Jennings, who uncovered one of the eight great mines in the history of the Gunnison country, three and a half miles up Copper Creek, known as the Sylvanite Mine. You go up Copper Creek, three and a half miles high up on the left side of the road, there's a zigzag road, and that goes up to the Sylvanite Mine. In case you're interested, and a lot of people say, like, what are the other seven? Here are the big eight precious metal mines in the history of the Gunnison country in no particular order. The Sylvanite at Gothic. The Doctor Mine up Spring Creek. When World War I opened, uh, they produced all kinds of lead and zinc came out of that mine for the war effort. The Gold Links and Carter Gold Mines up Gold Creek out of Ohio City. Up Gold Creek, they had four great gold mills. The Carter, the Gold Links, the Raymond, and the Comanche, all located up Gold Creek. The Forest Queen Mine of Irwin. The Gold Cup Mine of Tin Cup. And the famous Akron Tunnel at White Pine. The Akron Tunnel turned out a lot of lead and zinc also in World War I and World War II and was still operating in 1953. Those are the big nine, or the big eight. During the winter of 1879 and 80, late 79 and early 80, more than 1,000 miners flocked in to Gunnison heading north. And 10 miles out of Gunnison, they went past a toll bridge started by a man named Sam Fisher, who homesteaded 160 acres right there at a place known as Fisher's. Later on, it would be named for a racehorse and called Almont. And he made his way right past where Crested Butte is today, hardly anybody in Crested Butte at that time, and kept right on going and went on into Gothic. Some log cabins were built, but most of the miners in late 1879, early 1880, had built log cabins. Most of them lived in tents. And most of them weren't around during the winter of 79 and 80. They'd come in, in late 79. The town was incorporated in July of 1879. In that year, William McKee, then a very young boy, came into Gothic with his parents. And he described the town as, quote, having many saloons and gambling places and two dance halls. Every night a bonfire lit, was lit in the camp and a crowd would gather telling stories. Foot races with much money changing hands came. McKee told of a small bow-legged racer at Gothic who everybody thought was unbeatable. Crested Butte had a man they thought could beat him and a race was set up, 100 yards, right down the main street of Gothic. A lot of betting came. Gothic gamblers got wind that maybe their man was going to throw the race. The runner got word that if he lost, he would die. The Gothic runner won big. 
Crested Butte got even later on by sending a good runner into Gothic under the pretext of being highly intoxicated. <laughs> he entered a number of races and got his ass kicked in every one until the betting went way up. And then, not intoxicated, he won the big race, taking a lot of Gothic money with him. <laughs> Boxing matches were very popular on the weekends with champions from every camp fighting. Now, I'll tell you a little story about this. Uh, we, I hope all of you have heard of Jack Dempsey, the heavyweight champion of the world, a man born in Manassa, Colorado, about 11 miles south of Alamosa, and known as the Manassa Mauler. Got a museum there, a Jack Dempsey Museum there today. And Jack Dempsey fought all over western Colorado. He fought in Gunnison, where he was in to help put up the hay. He fought in Fruta and Grand Junction, where he worked in the peach uh, industry, picking peaches and apples and so on. And he went all over the place. And, he, and like he said later on, you never knew who you were going to meet on a Saturday night. A lot of betting, a lot of drinking, a lot of gambling. Jack Dempsey, I'll spare you the long story, 6'1", 195, not a big man, wound up going into New York and a great promoter named Tex Rickard found out about him. And Tex Rickard got Jack Dempsey, a great trainer, and Dempsey went on to win the heavyweight championship of the world, 1919 to 1926. One of his early defenses was against a Argentine fighter known as the Wild Bull of the Pampas, 6'6 and 250, Louis Furpo. And Jack Dempsey was winning the fight fairly comfortably, and in the early part of the third round, Louis Furpo caught Jack Dempsey with an overhand right and knocked him between the second and third strands of the ropes out of the ring, on the fly, and into a bunch of sports riders typing at ringside. Sports writers, chairs, and typewriters went flying. It took Jack Dempsey minimum 30 seconds to get back into the ring. And after he cleared his head, he knocked Furpo down seven times and hit him while he was on his knees, obviously against the Marcus of Queensbury rules. When the fight was over, the reporter asked Jack Dempsey what he thought of as he disappeared on the fly between the ropes. And he said, I remembered about the days in Colorado and Utah when I fought on a Saturday night and you never knew who you were fighting. And he said, I knew tonight, as I knew then, that I wasn't fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world tonight. He said I was fighting to keep from getting killed. And that's what he was fighting for in Utah and Colorado. You never knew. And this didn't involve eight-ounce eight, eight ounce boxing gloves either. In another famous scene, this tells you a lot about Jack Dempsey. In 1927, Jack Dempsey fought Gene Tunney. And Gene Tunney was a skilled boxer. He was a Shakespearean scholar. He didn't look like a great fighter. But Gene Tunney boxed Jack Dempsey's ears off until in the seventh round, Jack Dempsey caught him with a left hook and knocked him down and pretty much out. But Jack Dempsey stood over Gene Tunney and ignored the referee's command to get to a neutral corner. Seven or eight seconds elapsed before Dempsey went to the neutral corner. Tunney later on said that the first Word he heard was seven. I mean, Tunney was knocked out. But Dempsey wouldn't go to the neutral corner, and Tunney got up and outboxed Jack Dempsey for the last three rounds and won the heavyweight championship. How many people have seen a movie called Cinderella Man? Now we come to the last story of Jack Dempsey. He fought in Crested Butte. Fought in Gunnison. Jack Dempsey was a good friend of a guy named Max Baer, who was the heavyweight champion of the world in the middle 1930s. 
And Max Bear was a tremendous fighter, but he didn't, wasn't a great trainer. But he had power in both hands. He'd already killed two men in the ring. If you see Cinderella Man, it's based on a true story. And the, the guy who got the fight with Max Bear was Jimmy Braddock, an unemployed steel worker with three children, 37 years old. And nobody gave Braddock a chance, and everybody thought that Jimmy Braddock would be lucky to avoid getting killed in the ring. But this was his last chance. And in a magnificent, magnificent boxing exhibition, Jimmy Braddock boxed Max Beer's ears off for 15 rounds and won the heavyweight championship of the world. In the locker room after the fight, Jack Dempsey came in to see his good friend Max Bear. And Max Bear was uh, bitching, moaning, and whining BMWs about never getting away from that left jab of Jimmy Braddock. And Jack Dempsey said, Max, he said, I always knew you were stupid, but he said, I didn't think you were that stupid. And Max Bear got mad, went after Jack Dempsey, who tore off his sport coat, and they were going to get in a fight right in the locker room, and then cooler heads prevailed. And Max Bear said to Jack Dempsey after they cooled off, if you're so damn smart, what would you have done? And Jack Dempsey said, throw that left jab, Max. And Max Bear shot out a left jab. And Jack Dempsey took his right arm, and he hit Max Bear between the wrist and the shoulder, paralyzing the arm for 15 minutes. No feeling. Max Bear said, after howling with pain, you can't do that, that's illegal. And Jack Dempsey said, so what? They only warned you the first time. <laughs> when Jack Dempsey got you in trouble, they said, you stayed in trouble, and the trouble got progressively worse. One of the great heavyweight champions of all time. And he was in downtown Crested Butte around 1915 or 16, boxing as a young man while he was throwing some hay around for what ranchers I don't know, but I know he's in Crested Butte. Swain, back to the mountains that you were named, who's the final say on what gets named what? Like there are two Wilsons, two Treasuries. Yeah. Well, in the early day, depends on when, in the early days, the Hayden survey named most of them. And A.D. Wilson was one of uh, Hayden's men. Sam Emmons was one of Hayden's men. That's how Mount Emmons got his name, for Sam Emmons. So it's named primarily by the people who came in as surveyors. Now, a little later on, if mountains weren't named, you know, then the Colorado Mountain Club might name some. Collegiate range, you know, hell, the reason we got Yale, Harvard, Yale, and Oxford, and so on, Columbia, named for guys at those universities who came out here and climbed the mountains and arrogant enough to think they ought to name them after their university. You can tell a Harvard man, but you can't tell him much. So that's right, that's how they got named. I hope that answers the question. So a variety of ways you can get named. Another sport in Gothic very early was shooting with rifle or pistol. This was highly regarded at a time when wild game was needed, when a lot of desperados were around, and when Indians were very dangerous. In Gothic in 1879, 20 glass balls were set up at 50 yards away. And competitors from many mining camps came in and with pistols shot at small glass balls from 50 yards away. How many people here shoot handguns? Now, I'd, I would make a bet. <laughs> I'd bet my life on it. That not very many people are going to hit a glass ball from 50 yards away. All this crap you see in the movies, you know, about some guy resting a pistol and shooting a guy off a moving horse about 50 or 100 yards away. Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> Couldn't possibly happen. The winner of the shooting contest was some Crystal, who hit eight balls, eight balls out of 20. 
The Gothic paper said this about their candidate who got beat, and obviously people lost money betting on him. They thought he was pretty good. Quote, as the prize money was very large, Mills felt his defeat keenly. He may, not be, he may be able to make a good, many a good bullseye in a barn door, but he was not able to cope with a glass ball. <laughs> so the guy might be pretty damn good shooting at a barn door, but let's not bet on him again if he's got to shoot at some glass balls. <laughs> Gothic also had a coronet band in 1879 with polkas, shottishes, and Virginia reels being played. One party was described as, quote, and I'm quoting now, a gay one. It comprised the elite of the camp, rosy women who required neither powder nor paint to make them beautiful were there. No rouge, no lipstick, no powder, no, you know, they're just good-looking women. Twenty-five families stayed in Gothic during the winter of 79 and 80. That's it. It was one of the worst ever in the Elk Mountains. Now, I'll tell you a little story about that. Uh, in 1874, when Sylvester Richardson came into this area, uh, the Indians attempted to tell the white man that the winters were really a lot of snow and a lot of cold weather. But from 74 to 79, we had five of the mildest winters we ever had. And the white man simply thought that the Indians didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And then, the winter of 79 and 80 was one of the toughest we ever had. Every cow that was out didn't last very long. The snow was six feet on the level in Gothic. And the only contact with the outside came from the mail carrier, Louis Barthel. Now, a quick word on Louis Barthel. He carried the mail along the East River between Crested Butte and Gothic. One day, and I think I may have told you this story, one day he had to bring in a 10-gallon can of fuel oil. And he wasn't real happy about having to bring that in on skis. The next time he came in, the guy who ordered the 10-gallon can of fuel oil had ordered hip boots to work in the Jim Blaine mine. And Louis Barthel brought them in, one at a time. <laughs> the original road into Gothic in 1879 and 1880 was along the East River via the East River Toll Road. Didn't go through Crested Butte like today. In 1881, Gothic residents realized that several miles could be saved by putting a road in around the base of Snodgrass Mountain. And this became known as the Crested Butte and Gothic Toll Road. The original road right along the East River, right by the Veltry Ranch and right on into Gothic. One year later, the Crested Butte and Gothic Toll Road on the base of Snodgrass. In the year 1882, Aspen and Crested Butte jointly built the Pearl Pass Road. Now, the great mines were opening up on the other side of the divide, and they were opening up at a town called Ashcroft, about 11 miles from Aspen. The Tam O'Shanter Mine, the Montezuma Mine, one great mine after another. How many people in this group remember Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, see the hands, on King, on you Huskies. A guy named Stuart Mace lived in Ashcroft, and they used his dogs when the thing went on TV. That's where Sergeant Preston of the Yukon was filmed. So if you see the TV version, Stuart Mace and his sled dogs are right out there at Aspen. Ashcroft miners were being charged five cents a pound for shipping into Leadville. Now, how are they going to get into Leadville from Ashcroft? They're going into Aspen to go over Independence Pass, right? Highest paved road today in the United States over the Continental Divide. 
12,095 feet. Into Crested Butte, the cost was one cent a pound. The first pack train over Pearl Pass came on July the 3rd, 1882. An 11 borough train came over, going through six foot deep snow near the top of the pass on July the 3rd. By 1883, two cars of ore daily came into Crested Butte to the railhead from the Montezuma Mine, which is owned by Horace Tabor in Montezuma Basin. One of my presentations a little later on is going to be on Aspen, because Aspen had a big impact on Crested Butte. Aspen, Colorado, after 1887 when the railroad arrived, was the number one silver camp in the world. In the world. And stayed that way for 10 years. Didn't have a railroad till 1887. So the only way that you get ore out of Aspen was by jack train through Gothic and into the railhead at Crested Butte. And the only way to get supplies back to Aspen was over East Maroon, West Maroon, Pearl Pass, whatever pass they happened to use back into Aspen. Did they what? I'm coming to that. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. So Aspen had no railroad until 1887. Now here's the problem on that Pearl Pass Road. The problem was when you got to the top of the pass and you dropped into Aspen, you dropped 4,915 feet in 18 miles. Now I've ridden my mountain bike over Pearl Pass, and I'll tell you, you're on a road right now, and of course it's got all those mud holes, you know, and even if they're dry, and I mean, it's steeper than hell. You're on your brakes all, that's a thousand foot drop per mile, almost, on into Aspen. The pass remained very difficult and was always only a jack trail. The road on the Brush Creek side was described as, quote, the last eight miles will require a large amount of work as the builders of the road disregarded the route of the engineers and ran over hills and boulders, making it absolutely impassable by teams. No way you're taking stages over there. No way you're taking wagons over there pulled by mules. Jackasses or burros can make it with 200 pounds on their back. Anytime you overloaded a burro, the burro would sit down and emit a shrill whistle, reminding the miners of canaries, hence the name Rocky Mountain Canaries. That's what the burros were called. It was a great book. If you have a chance to read it by David Smith called On the Backs of Burrows. Those little animals were courageous. Without them, this area would have never opened up. When Aspen got a railroad in 1887, the Denver and Rio Grande built out of Leadville and over Fremont Pass and ran into Aspen. The Colorado Midland Railroad in February of 1888, Broad Gauge Railroad also arrived. Colorado Midland ran from Colorado Springs, Florissant, Lake Grant, over Trout Creek Pass, Hagerman Pass, down the frying pan, into Basalt, 19 mile branch to Aspen, kept right on going to Grand Junction, 242 miles away. First broad gauge railroad over the Continental Divide in Colorado. So Aspen's got two railroads in 87 and 88. When they got the railroad, burrows were not needed and for many years roamed in the hills around Crested Butte. Wild burrows roaming, surviving the winters. Frank Stewart, who built the road from Aspen up Maroon Creek, East Maroon Creek to connect to the Copper Creek Road into Gothic did that one in 1883. So you got a road now running from Aspen up Maroon Creek over East Maroon Pass, 
right on into Gothic. When the road was finished, a mail route was established, and a couple of guys named Pollard and Chapin ran a passenger and mail stage over East Maroon Pass. Mail route and stage. In the winter, they used bobsleds. Pulled by horses, usually horses. Now here's the deal on horses. I got a great picture in Taylor Park of a horse pulling a bobsled on a mail route. And in the back of the caption it says, a guy named Brown is you know, behind the horse. And he says, will Brown step off of the trail? Brown knows better than that. Because if you step off of the trail, you're going up to your waist or your shoulders. So the trail is packed down every day. Otherwise, no way. Quote, they left Crested Butte at 8 a.m., and if snow slides did not turn them over, they would arrive at Aspen at 4 p.m. In that year, Ray Lashear of Gothic built a dinner station for stages, and another two men built stables for freight teams right at Copper Lake. So at Copper Lake, we got a dinner station for sages, and we got stables for freight teams to rest before they assault the pass the next morning. <coughs> the freight teams made the trip in two days to Aspen and stayed overnight at Copper Lake. 500 jackasses made daily trips over East Maroon Pass into Gothic and then Crested Butte to the railhead to drop off Aspen ore. Every day, 500 burrows from Aspen over the pass into Gothic to the railhead at Crested Butte. They then returned to Aspen with supplies. All this went on until Aspen got a railroad in 1887 and 1888. In the mid-1880s, in response to Jim's comment here, there were plans of building a Denver and Rio Grande narrow gauge railroad over East Maroon Pass and into Aspen. In the early 80s, I don't know about you, but when you... Uh, Go over East Maroon Pass, I mean, you're, you're at 11,800 feet. But, I mean, guys like Otto Mears did build railroads through terrain like that. Never came to pass because all the mines began to shut down. Avalanches were a constant threat on the pass. In 1885, a newspaper report said, quote, the remains of A.C. Adair, the Crested Butte and Aspen mail carrier who lost his life by a snow slide on Pearl Pass near Ashcroft, will be buried in Aspen. In 1886, slides came off East Maroon Pass during a storm, sweeping the stage off the road in November, killing two horses and burying the driver who was able to dig himself out. In January of 86, a tremendous storm hit Crested Butte and the Gothic region, dropping two feet of snow. Four Crested Butte men were killed in a snow slide on Maroon Pass. Four others dug themselves out. Another avalanche hit cabins near Gothic, coming off of Gothic Peak, killing three and entombing five all night. When dug out, they were barely alive. Jack trains out of Crested Butte were caught in slides. And at the Excelsior Mine in Poverty Gulch, three Crested Butte men were killed by a slide. Count them up. Four, three, and three. Ten guys in a matter of three or four days killed in avalanches right around Gothic. Gothic at its peak in 1881. 1,000 people in town. 3,000 people in the surrounding area. Five law firms, four stores, three restaurants, one bank, two hotels. The Gothic Hotel was three stories high with 32 rooms. The Olds Hotel was two stories high, 27 rooms. 
And it also, Gothic, also had three newspapers. Elk Mountain Bonanza, the Gothic Miner, and the Gothic Silver Record. And one great mine after another. Sylvanite, Jim Blaine, Mountain King, Virginius, and others. More about them later. Chinese generally were not accepted in mining camps because they worked for low wages and because they were alien. In late 1880, the Chinese in small numbers came to Gothic. One guy opened up a laundry. The women in town who washed clothes could not compete with the cheap rates. And an anti-Chinese organization was formed and, quote, the pigtailed man was ordered to leave immediately. When he refused, he was taken out and hung from a nearby tree. James McCarthy was in Gothic when the hanging happened. And after he left, he wrote under the title of Fitz Mac, one of the great writers of the West, became famous and wrote for an organization called The Great Divide and he recounted the hanging. During the winter of 1873 and 1874, a man by the name of Gustav Eriksson from Sweden stayed in Gothic. He had been a member of the Parsons Expedition. We talked about the first day. Came in with Sylvester Richardson, Geological Expedition, 73. When everybody left, he stayed. And he wintered there at Gothic with a Negro named General Green, who had come in a year earlier. Green died that winter, and the body was buried in the snow until spring. Erickson never left. Died in Gunnison, 1928. In 1880, former U.S. President U.S. Grant visited Gothic after he asked to be taken to the, quote, wildest, rootinest, tootinest mining camp in the state. He took the train to Salida, Barlow and Sanderson staged to Gunnison, and horse and wagon into Gothic. He was met a mile from Gothic by a band of men on horseback and welcomed by a huge explosion of giant powder. The men got Grant into a poker game that night, and they deliberately tried to lose to Grant and pay him off in stock so they could say that Grant owned mining stock in Gothic. <laughs> but Grant was aware of what was going on, and he held his liquor very well. Two 10-stamp mills existed in Gothic. You all remember what a stamp mill is? Stamps pul pulverizing the ore. We talked about that the first day. Here's something you may not know. One got its power from Copper Creek, with water falling 300 feet and less than a half mile near the town. I'm quoting. One perpendicular descent of 50 feet amid massive and quaintly carved vertical buttresses of granite is a scene of rare beauty. Judd Falls. The other mill got its power from the descending East River. So one mill, 10 stamp mill, got its power off Copper Creek. The other got its power from the descending East River. Now, you folks have been on the East River, and this isn't where the powerhouse was, but you'll know that there is a waterfall out there that drops probably, what, 50 to 60 feet? And lunatics and kayaks go off of it. But the mill was closer to Gothic. So one tan stamp mill is powered by water power on Copper Creek, and the other one powered by water power on the East River. The Mountain King Mine in Rustner Gulch also had its own powerhouse. Lou Waite, W-A-I-T, ran the Gothic Silver Record newspaper until 1888, and then he declared this. After living on wind pudding, Copper Creek soup, Gothic scenery, and promises from bummer subscribers, he sold out and went back to mining. 
In 1884, he won the throw of the dice to break a tie with Garwood Judd for mayor of Gothic. They threw dice. Ernest Ingersoll, who came through Gothic in 1882, said this, The streets are filled with trains of burrows loaded with packs of provisions for the mountain camps. And at night, the drowning cry of the car dealers and yells of hilarious prospectors resound through the darkness. But do not worry, respectable sleepers, who know it is nothing more than the boys just having a little racket. Every Sunday, horse races and singing parties. Cornish miners had fine singing voices, and practically everybody could play an instrument. And they had, as I said, a cornet band, played on weekends, played during holidays, played during special religious ceremonies. Gothic also had a, quote, outside church with seats on rude wooden slabs laid on blocks. So you want to go to church? You sit outside on some planks suspended on cement blocks. A sensational incident occurred in March of 1884 near Gothic in Wolverine Basin. Frank LaBelle was skiing when he heard a noise behind him. It was a mountain line, and LaBelle went down the mountain at an estimated 40 miles an hour. But, the, but at the bottom had a cross a ravine. With his pocket knife between his teeth, he made for a big tree. Just when he got to the tree, the mountain lion lunged at him, a 20-foot lunge, and buried himself in the deep snow. As the head appeared, LaBelle hit him with his ski pole. They fought for a minute with LaBelle using his pole to hit the lion. He took wounds in return. Finally, LaBelle got on the back of the lion and cut the jugular with his knife. He then skied into Gothic and led a party back to gut the lion, which measured nine feet two inches. Another incident involved a guy named Captain Bunn, B-U-N-N, love this one. Bunn came up with a new invention. He eliminated the guide pole in skiing. Quote, his new invention consisted of strong cords, one end of which is fastened to the tip of each ski. He handles these cords in the same manner he would the reins over a team of strong runaway horses. It is a fine sight to see the captain come a-clipping down a steep run, but a still finer sight when his shoes begin to buck, as they will persist in doing at times. So here he comes down the mountain, and he's got holes in the tips of his skis and cords. And when he's turning like this, turning like this, no guide pole. A great invention that went a glimmering. <laughs> Last I heard of it. The great minds of Gothic were the following. The Sylvanite up Copper Creek, Jim Blaine, two miles north of the camp. The Elk Mountain at the head of Rustler Gulch. The Mountain King at 12,500 feet on a steep slope in Rustler Gulch. And the Mountain King's powerhouse, 36 foot square, two boilers, and a compressor. Next time you're mountain biking in that area, imagine that powerhouse. And the last great mine was the one up Queens Basin, which is not in the shadows, kind of a white rock mountain up near the head of Copper Creek. Louis Barthel, I mentioned a little earlier, the great snowshoe carrier, the great mail carrier. He was the guy who carried the mail between Crested Butte and Gothic. Some of the time, carried it over Schofield Pass. Quote, one winter, he carried Uncle Sam's post, the hardest route of all, from Crested Butte over Pearl Pass into Aspen. According to his young daughters who were with him living in Gothic and wrote about him later on, 
There was no contact with the outside world in the winter except through daily messages and letters and packages carried on the back of the strong and powerful man who never failed. The girl said this, We used to hear the loud roaring and watch the huge slides that came down Gothic Mountain across the river from town. Mining went on at a very small scale in the 1880s and 1890s and up to about World War I. However, the weak price of silver, the short season, and the fact that the mines just did not have high-grade ore ended the mining history of Gothic. But the Sylvanite would go down in history as a mine which produced over $1 million worth of silver. It was called the Mine of Silver Wires. The Mine of Silver Wires. Four of eight. Let's take about a two-minute break. You know, as I've been going through all of this with you, back in the old days, so to speak, uh, there's a great song, and I was just thinking of it, I kind of grew up with, and it always reminds me of Crested Butte. Okay, see if I can remember it. Well, something like this. Those were the days, my friend. We thought they'd never end. We thought we'd live forever in a day. We'd pick the life we'd choose. We thought we'd never lose because we were young and always thought we'd have our way. And I always say, and we have in Crested Butte, and we have. Here, here, here indeed. All right, here we go. I'm going to finish off Gothic, and I may even introduce the uh, ethnic people of Crested Butte here uh, before the end. Uh, one of the people who came into Gothic in the very early 1880s commented on how hard it was to get around. And he said this, Every man, woman, and child had to learn to ski in Crested Butte in vicinity. We had to learn if we wanted to get anywhere. All outlying districts were inhabited in those days. Irwin, Gothic, Crystal City, Pittsburgh, and all over the Elk Mountains. If residents wanted to come into Crested Butte, they had to come in on skis. And it was not uncommon to see 50 pairs of skis in front of M.J. Gray's store while miners were inside buying goods. Gothic had some tremendous skiers. And I'll give you one great example. One race that was held in 1886, probably the highlight of all the seasons in the Gunnison country. This was a race that was held in March on the side of Gothic Mountain. Very steep. Course was 1,900 feet long. 17 skiers were entered and ran in heats of three. Quote, the most exciting race of the season was the final heat in which Frank Williams of Crystal and R.R. Sterling of Schofield made a very close run. One of the latter's shoes, or skis, running between Williams and the two men almost touching as they crossed the finish line with Williams in the lead. Garwood H. Judd, born in Ohio, 1852, attended Oberlin College, very good college. Took classes in geology. When his health began to fail, he went west to recover. Was in Kansas for a while and then came by the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad to Pueblo. From there he made his way into Gunnison on April the 23rd, 1880, walking. No railroad yet. On May the 26th he came to Gothic. He bought a lot in a small building for $300. Very early, he ran a saloon and a gambling house. Judd was also elected a trustee in Gothic, and he owned part of a lot of mines, but he did very little actual mining. When Gothic went downhill, he stayed and became a caretaker and a realtor for the buying and selling of mining property. He loved visitors. And he had every one of them sign a register 
so he could show the county commissioners how many people came in in an effort to get a road built into Gothic. In 1928, a photographer named Lee Orr, who worked for the Fox Film Company, came in and made Garwood Judd the subject of the documentary called The Man Who Stayed. It was a two-reel movie. During many winters, as he got older, Garwood Judd resided in the Levita Hotel in Gunnison. Judd held every position in Gothic, and when the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory came, he was established in 1928 as the unofficial man who stayed and the unofficial mayor of Gothic. As more people came in after the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, tourists, stockmen, campers, almost everybody visited Judd. And in his house they saw, quote, a museum of early day photos, relics, and scrapbooks. He died in May of 1930, and his ashes were spread around Gothic and Judd Falls by Dr. John C. Johnson, the head of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, and Ben Jorgensen, who was the county commissioner of the time. Today, the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory is in its 88th year. It made a lot of upgrades to the buildings. During the summer, Professors and students come from all over the United States and in some cases all over the world. You can see license plates from practically everywhere to do high altitude research, studies on climate change, and other scientific research. One of the major problems that we have in Gothic today, I certainly testify to that, I don't know if I'm ever going to ride my mountain bike except very early in the morning from Gothic up towards 401. I mean, the traffic is unbelievable. Unbelievable. At that campground there, just before you get to Avery Peak, when people park on the side of the road, hell, it looked like Grand Central Station. Uh, Jim, they, anybody uh, talking about that at all? Yeah, but made our money. <laughs> what, is the, uh, what are the options? Well, the one thing we're talking about this year is, is having the bus run to uh, the um, uh, East Maroon Trailhead uh, bus from town. Right now it stops in Gothic. They're talking about getting up, going up a little further so you can ride. You could mountain bike along the road, though. Yeah. yeah. But no vehicles. It's just an option rather than taking a car up there. It's real difficult to cut it all off. Who's in charge of that, the Forest Service? Forest Service. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. It's got to be a little hard on the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, too. Oh, it's just unbelievably dusty. Yeah. Unbelievable. In 1969, to spruce up the July 4th celebration in Crested Butte. Now, a lot of you people don't remember the old 4th of July celebrations in Crested Butte. Nothing like they are today. I don't know how many people they have in Crested Butte on July the 4th. To me, it looks like the end of World War II in New York City. Every year the parade starts farther down by the high school, right? It's unbelievable. I mean, would 10,000 people be a guess? More than that even, 10,000 people, 10, 15,000 people. But in the old days, you didn't have hardly anybody. It didn't have uh, very many people. So to spruce it up, my good friend and yours, George Sibley, decided to start an eight-mile running race between Gothic and Crested Butte, starting in downtown Gothic and finishing up in Crested Butte. Now, I think I ran that thing for like 40 years in a row. And I believe me, the last two or three days, I kind of dreaded it, even though I was in good shape, but that's a tough race. And especially the toughest part is running downhill because the next two days, I'm like this. <laughs> Your calves are just shot. And uh, so anyway, Sibley, he didn't know too much about running. And he thought, well, you know, he was just nonchalant. They didn't really know where they were going to have the uh, end of the race. 
And all at once, somebody yelled out to George, here comes the runner. Some guy was a good runner and he was moving. So Sibley, immediately somebody had a flower sack and he grabbed the flower sack, split it open and, and ran flour across Elk Avenue about where Don, where, uh, who are the people I'm thinking of? Hageman's store. Just in time for the runner who came in. Today, the race has been going for 46 years in a row. 300 runners or so now run by the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. And the record for the 8.5 miles is held by an ex Adam State runner named Charlie V. Hill in the unbelievable time of 42 minutes and 26 seconds. Now remember, they weren't running down the path that we have today. You stayed on the road. So today it's a little longer. In the old days you stayed right on the road, but that's still a hell of a time. The race today is affectionately known as the race, walk, or crawl, run, walk, or crawl race. That's it on Gothic. Are there any questions on Gothic? You said one year 25 families stayed? 26. 26 Did that number ever grow, or was it always a small? Well, I think the following winter, I don't have any actual records on that, but the big, the big year was 80-81, and I'm sure there were more then. But remember, in 7980, I mean, you had a few log cabins and, and then tents. So if you didn't have a log cabin, you're probably not going to stay. But then the hotels were built. You know, people come into Gothic today, and can you fathom having a three-story high hotel with 32 rooms? A two-story high hotel with 27 rooms. Do you know where they were? Yeah, if you look at the town plat, um, the hotel would have been just east of that new building they have, you know, like the commerce, the, the, the uh, village center that they have, yeah. And then two 10 stamp mills, powerhouse up Rustler Gulch. And remember, the one thing I want you to remember about Gothic is it is a hub. Without Gothic, I mean, Aspen would have been in big trouble. Absolutely, maybe more. Well, uh, when I say around, now remember, these people weren't around in the winter time. You know, they would. I would say they'd be in during May, June, July, August, September, October, six months. Uh, I would say uh, all the way to Schofield Pass in the north. Uh, you know, how halfway to Crested Butte in the south. Um, all the way to the top of Rune Pass to the east, and uh, then, you know, probably filtering into Washington Gulch, Slate River in the west. Absolutely, all over the place. So when they left for the winter, do you have any idea of where a common place to go was? Just <laughs> south? Well, when the hotels were operating, the hotels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's where the center of action was. Now remember, these people had a lot of fun. You know, it wasn't all, I mean, I can't tell you, you know, I grew up in an immigrant community, I already told you. And every weekend there was a wedding dance. And every weekend, polkas, shoddishes, shoddish. One, two, three, hop, one, two, three, hop, one, hop, two, hop, three, hop, four, hop. <laughs> I got to get done to play the shoddish. That was one. The Virginia reel is two. But the polka is the big one. So there was a lot of fun had, a lot of enjoyment. Any other questions on Gothic? You know that you said ore was taken out, silver ore. Where was it refined? Oh, you mean where was the smelter? Yeah. Was that the? Well, Gunnison. Well, no, the stamp mill only reduced it. Uh -huh. You know, the, to get the separation, which is very complex. Gunnison had three smelters. As you come into Gunnison on the right side of the road, about 
three miles outside of Gunnison, you see a big red chimney on the right side of the road. Laura, Patrick and Shaw smelled her. In Mountaineer Bowl, Western State College campus, or university campus, right above the football field on Cupolo Hill, Moffitt smelled her. Right down where the uh, airport is today, Tamichi Valley smelled her. 100 feet long, 75 feet wide, and three stories high. None worked. <laughs> because the ore, as I told you, is very complex. And it was low-grade ore. You know, make the final separation is very difficult. It really wouldn't have worked in the Gunnison country anyway because the ore wasn't high-grade enough for people to make money off of it. Other questions? If not, we've got a little time left. How are we doing on time? I'm just going to introduce this. Question. Yeah, there's, uh, well, there's all kinds of mines, and I've got names of them, but I wouldn't be able to pick one. You know, there's a big mine on top of Galena Peak, too, right off of uh, Schofield Pass. Yeah, Bellevue had mines. If you read Carl Haas's thesis on Gothic, every mine they ever had is there. I'd really encourage you to read the thesis. I'm going to open up, just, just open up on the ethnic peoples of Crested Butte. I just call it the immigrants of Crested Butte. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you a little personal thing before I go on. Uh, my dad was born in Antwerp. My grandfather came over in 1919 and went back to get the family. And my dad was 10 years old, and they came through Ellis Island in 1920. And I wasn't smart enough to ask him more questions about this. But if you can imagine immigrants coming to the United States not speaking the language, not knowing anybody. My dad said when he remembered when they went through Ellis Island, the first thing they did was they sprayed them just like cattle, kill any lice they had from the three-week boat trip across. And then you're on your own. You don't have a whole lot of money. So... You know, the immigrants, the United States is a melting pot of civilization. And we are all really immigrants. The only non-immigrants in this country are the Native American Indians. Here is the Colossus. These are the words on the Statue of Liberty. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering links outside from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, mother of exiles from her beacon hand, glows worldwide welcome her mild eyes command. The air bridge harbor that twin cities frame, keep ancient lands your storied, storied name, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I says it all. You know, my grandfather, I asked my dad one time, I said, well, how come Grandpa doesn't go back to Belgium and see his remaining brothers and sisters and cousins and so on. And my dad said because he thinks if he goes back to Belgium, something bad may happen and a war may break out and he won't be able to get back. He's an American. They want to go back. There's a reason they left, right? Come for a better life. Always come for a better life. And the number one priority was that, and those people worked hard, but I mean, they came because they had hope. And that's what the U.S. is all about. And a man, I go back and forth on immigration today. Because those people are doing work that most Americans don't want to do. I have picked potatoes. I have picked potatoes one quarter mile long, 140 long, 
with a basket and burlap sacks. And the potatoes are dug up. You don't, you don't have damn potato pickers like they have today. And you're walking along and you're picking those potatoes and putting them in the metal basket and then putting the metal basket into the burlap sack and about four or five of the metal baskets go into the burlap sack and that's 100 pounds and you tie the, the bag and then when the uh, truck comes by or the wagon comes by, you throw it into the wagon. You pick one row of potatoes, that is the hardest, most back-breaking work that you can ever do in your life. And you go to California and you see those people picking strawberries and lettuce, I got a hell of a lot of respect for them. A lot of respect for those people. Who are here for one big reason. Same reason any immigrant ever came to the United States. <laughs> they want a better life, want to make more money. And it just, I mean, it just frustrates the hell out of me that the Congress of the United States can't pass an immigration bill. You know, World War II, it's pretty easy. Give me five minutes, I'll give you an immigration bill. Give me another five minutes, I'll give you Social Security and make sure that it's uh, solvent. Number one in Social Security, federal government doesn't touch any Social Security money. Nobody borrows from Social Security. That money stays in the fund. And number two, people like me who are over 65, we all agree, we say, we're not collecting any Social Security until we're 67. Five minutes, that takes care of Social Security. No, we go on to immigration. Immigration, World War II, we had a guest worker program. People come to this country and they work during the time that you're picking strawberries and you're picking lettuce, and then they can go back to Mexico or Honduras, wherever they want, and they can come back in. Guest worker program. Takes care of immigration. That's enough. We're out of here. Now remember, <laughs> next week, next week we're talking about the ethnic groups of Crested Butte, so pass the word. And the following week, polka time, music time, pizza time. We're out of here. Thanks. <laughs>